So let's now look at two more patients. Patient number three, Ebony Zarin. She's an 18-year-old female presented in the emergency room with severe abdominal pain accompanied by persistent vomiting, as well as a chest pain accompanied by severe cough and difficulty in breathing. So this patient presented also with rashes covering her arms or legs or trunk or face. The patient indicated that the that general flu-like symptoms um, were the first things that were noticed, fever, chills, aches, and then um, uh, it just kept get, kind of getting worse, right? The patient also returned, this was found out in the, in the history, that returned from a trip to Zaire where she had been volunteering in an orphanage for about two months and right at the very end of her volunteer work, uh, there was a very sick child whose illness was unknown and she was near this child and so it's likely that maybe that sick child perhaps passed something on to patient number three. The lab results showed an extensive internal organ damage and bleeding and before they could even continue with any more studies the patient began to have seizures and eventually died. Uh, so this is about eight days after the initial symptoms began. Tissue samples were analyzed during the autopsy and um, electron micrograph picture of a uh, pathogen was found. Um, this pathogen looked like this, where it kind of had this long structure that kind of wound around itself. And when they looked in even closer, the membrane on the outside here seemed to have many, many characteristics of a human cellular membrane as well. So if we look at kind of a diagram of, of what they were looking at, you had this membrane here in, these, in purple on the outside. Then there was this yellow chain on the, in the inside, and this was found to be a protein chain. Then there was this, uh, this small piece of RNA, so of nucleotide material. Um, and then there was this uh, green, well, this thing here that's depicted in green that, that um, looked to be like an enzyme that could copy RNA in, in some fashion. And so this is, this is what they, they found. So what should we notice about this? Well, this pathogen contains RNA, not DNA. It has a cell membrane, but the, that membrane you know, had lots of characteristics that seemed more human-like than anything. And then it had that long piece of protein you know, all the way throughout. Well, what, it, what would this be suggesting? Well, it suggests that it's probably not a living cell. Um, it's rather a virus. <clears throat> and and uh, you know, it didn't have any ribosomes on the inside, for example. And so that's one thing that you could look to. Kind of had, you, you know, this, this specific shape. It was introduced probably into Ebony in Africa um, when she came in contact with that sick child. And it took a few weeks from the time of exposure before the symptoms eventually, you know, got so bad and then she succumbed and died. All right, next patient, patient number four, Patty Loma. Patty Loma was a 35-year-old mother of two presented uh, to her gynecologist with unusual vaginal discharge and, and complained of painful intercourse. Her gynecologist immediately performed a pap smear and came back with this diagnosis, stage 3 cervical cancer. Furthermore, they went in and looked at this and there was, um, there, there was this cancerous growth here and it seemed to also have um, some types of, uh, you know, there was like these infections that were, that were on this as well. Um, when they questioned her about her lifestyle, she admitted that she had had multiple sexual partners during her young pre-married years. So they did performed a pap smear and this revealed infection with a certain pathogen that was found there. So here's kind of a, a scan of what that was and then kind of a recreated structure of what this pathogen looked like. So you can see it's kind of spherical and so forth. After they continued to look at this more and more, they were able to kind of figure out what this might be and here's a diagrammatic um, uh, drawing of what of some of the important parts of this pathogen. It had a protein coat on the outside and then it had double-stranded DNA on the inside. So what should we notice about this pathogen? Well it contains DNA instead of RNA like the last one. It also contains some protein but that's it. There were no ribosomes again or nothing else. So this would definitely suggest once again that this is not a living cell based on our definition of what a living cell is right from the from the other lectures. Um, still had this kind of geometric shape and it was introduced likely into Patty many, many years ago during um, sexual activity and uh, then did not cause symptoms for many decades. So as we stated in this case, we're not looking at bacteria now, we're looking at viruses. Viruses can, be, can have either DNA or RNA and, and those nucleic acids can be either double-stranded or single-stranded. They typically have protein coats or protein structures. Uh, when it's this coat, we call it a capsid. And the, um, 
the viruses can be enveloped or not enveloped. Uh, the envelope, this what we refer to as that membrane, right, that cellular membrane around the outside, typically comes is borrowed from the from the host as well. And so, in the case that we were looking at of ebony, uh, that that cellular membrane actually came from one of the cells of ebony. So before we go further, we need to learn a little bit about how do, how do viruses work. And so I want to show you that a virus is, is put together with this head that contains the DNA, or could be RNA. Um, there, there can be these tails, and then these tail fibers, right? It looks like a, almost like a, a little space probe or something, right? Um, here we're looking at how this um, infects a bacteria. So it attaches to the bacteria it kind of in, sticks through the bacteria like a needle almost and then injects the DNA inside of the bacteria which is then um, starts to go through synthesis so the genes that are on that DNA start to be synthesized they start to be read and and interpreted and then you start to make those genes have all of the, the genes necessary to make all of the parts of the virus and so the cell this bacterial cell stops doing what bacteria ought to be doing and starts just making viruses and then once the viruses get all assembled, then essentially the bacterial cell ruptures and you get all these viruses that, that are, are let out. And that's called the lytic cycle. In animal cells, it's similar, but not quite the same. In the animal cell here, we have the, this, uh, so here's, here's a, a, a virus that comes and, and the um, capsid part of the virus is introduced into the host cell. The viral genome comes out, in this case we're looking at an RNA genome, and then that's served as a template. And that template then gets, you know, um, read and you start to make different types of proteins and, and other parts that are going to become part of the virus again. Uh, you can make more copies of that RNA so that you can put those copies into a new viral virus as well. And then you assemble the virus and as the virus buds off, the, the, the um, envelope Right? or this, this, cell, this membrane on the outside here actually becomes a part uh, or came from the original host cell. And so then you've got a new virus. Some examples of this are like influenza and Ebola. So the, um, um, in bacteria, something that's interesting that happens, you have this lytic cycle that we already explained but you can have this lysogenic cycle that works in conjunction with this lytic cycle. So if a bacteria gets infected, sometimes it will stop doing the lytic cycle and it will come over to the lysogenic cycle, where now the bacteria, um, the, the uh, DNA from the uh, virus gets introduced into the bacterial's own genome. So we call it now a prophage. Phage um, DNA refers to DNA that uh, is going to infect bacterial cells here. So then this bacteria then just starts dividing, and it divides and divides. And this can just keep going where it just keeps dividing and dividing and dividing. But every time it divides, it still has that viral DNA as part of its own genome. And then at any point, any one of these bacteria can then switch and go into the lytic cycle where it starts to actually make the viruses. And so this can, in essence, allow viruses to be dormant in an organism for, for many, many um, generations until in one generation all of a sudden, boom, it switches back to the, light, to the lytic cycle and produces more viruses. In an animal cell, again, it's similar to, um, to this, but in animal um, cells, the, the virus genes um, never leave the host genome. Okay. And in animal cells, it, a lot of times it doesn't actually kill the animal cell either. Um, it it um, does it a little bit differently. So here we're looking at HIV, where um, HIV gets introduced into the cell. The RNA um, gets read, but in this case, the, this virus comes with another um, enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which actually reads this RNA strand and copies it, but copies it into DNA. And, and then it can do that a couple times, and now it's made a DNA uh, copy of all of the genes. That gets introduced into the genome, and then now it, um, the, the cell itself just starts to kind of 
stop doing what it should be doing and it starts to read those those um, viral genes and starts to make all of the parts to make more viruses. So it's almost as if the, the cell's been hijacked by the virus and the virus now just tells the cell, you're just going to make more viruses. You're not going to do what, what you're supposed to be doing. And so you start making more and more viruses and, and so you get more viruses made. And again, this can also be have this kind of um, cycle where it becomes part of the DNA but then kind of lays dormant for a while and then it, and at some point later on in li later on down the road it gets kicked into a lytic cycle and and you start to produce the actual viruses. So what were the diseases? Can you think about what they might have been? Well Ebony had Ebola, Zaire strain, and Patty had human papillomavirus, right, which is um, the virus that causes, you know, warts, genital warts, these types of things, and can lead to cancers. So um, if we review then uh, kind of a comparison chart here, DNA and RNA were present in, um, our, can, our DNA is present in bacteria, and then they produce RNA um, when they're transcribing the DNA to make the proteins, but viruses can have only RNA or they can have DNA. Um, were ribosomes present in bacteria? Yes, and they were never present in viruses. So this is one of the key characteristics, right, that you can look to and say, is that a cell or not a cell? Um, the structures, we had right different shapes for the uh, bacterial, and we also had these congregation patterns. And typically in the viruses, we see kind of that capsid surrounding the nucleic acid, where they can be some that are enveloped or non-enveloped. In bacteria, we can look at gram-positive and gram-negative. In viruses, they have that lytic um, cycle and the lysogenic cycle where viruses can hide. So because we're talking about diseases, it's appropriate also to kind of give a, a, pri a real quick, quick primer on immune systems. And this is the other thing that causes symptoms. When, when someone is sick, you know, it can be toxins in the body can cause symptoms, but also the immune system itself can be some of the major causes of actual symptoms that we that, that we go through when we're sick. So let's um, have kind of this cartoon um, walkthrough of what happens in, in the immune system. So there are these cells called B cells in your immune system and these B cells have on their outsides they have these little structures that go and try to match up to different types of cells in your body and as long as they you know things match up well they go oh that's that's my own cell and so they don't worry about it but whenever they hit something that looks foreign to them like in the example of this green little bacteria here the B cell finds um, this and it matches one of its receptors and so it says aha you are foreign so then it wait it kind of keeps attached and it waits for a helper T cell to come and activate this B cell then the B cell goes and start to divide and it makes plasma cells and memory cells so let's first look at the plasma cells these plasma cells produce lots and lots of antibodies that are going to match the shape found on um, this bacterial um, cell here and so it kind of targets it right and gets it ready and then these eater cells, you know, macrophages and, and white blood cells and other things, come along and they, they find these, these bacteria that have been tagged by these antibodies and they go, hmm, that, looks, that one looks good, right? I'm going to eat that one. And so it basically eats it and gets, gets rid of it. While at the same time, these memory cells that we saw over here, these memory cells say, okay, there's a bunch of them and they remember what that bacterial cell looked like, or at least what that shape on the outside of the bacterial cell look like. And so they're primed and ready to go in case that bacteria ever tries to enter the system again. So you can think of it at the, the, at the beginning of the cycle, there's maybe only a few B cells in, that, that could have recognized that bacteria. But now that you, this B cell has divided and divided and divided, it's produced you know hundreds of thousands of these memory cells that are now all ready to go and, pr and they're ready and primed to, to, uh, to attack that bacteria should it try to enter the body again.